Christmas to you guys. All right, it's wonderful to have you here this morning. Uh, like, like Chad said, the Lord was inspiring both of us at the same time. We came up with the same passage of Scripture. So, hey, that's the Lord. He wants us to know something here this morning. So let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to that passage of Luke. You know, it's funny when, when you're pastoring uh, and you come to Christmas and you come to uh, Easter, you know, there's always this pressure to to not go over the same passages over and over again every year and give the same message, you know, but it's the same story every time, but there's a lot of different ways to look at it. And uh, as I was out in Eureka, I was always uh, trying to go around the story and, and tell things around the story and not really get at the story that everybody's heard over and over and over again. But uh, this time I, I just felt like the Lord drawing me right to this passage. And it's very un- very important one as we see this response of these these shepherds out in the field uh, as the angels come and reveal to them what's going to happen. Uh, the, the angels begin to sing glory to God in the highest and, and talking about the joy, talking about don't fear. And boy, do we need that right now. We, we certainly do. And so let's go ahead and read those verses once again. Uh, if you, as you look at chapter 2, you know, Jesus has already been born there. They've been brought down to Bethlehem from Nazareth because there's a, a census being taken and they have to go down there. And, and so there they are. Uh, the baby is born. Jesus is born in, and laid in that manger in swaddling clothes. And then in verse 8, you see there, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord before them stood before them, And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you glad tidings or good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a great multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word here this morning. Lord, as we come to this very special time of the year, remembering uh, your son coming to be born and coming into this earth to share with us your plan of redemption, your plan of salvation. Lord, we come this morning with eager hearts. Lord, we come this morning with ears and eyes wide open, desiring to see this very powerful story in a, in a whole new light, Lord. Lord, as we look over passages like this, there's a tendency for us to just say, yeah, I've heard that one before. But Father, today that it would become so real in our lives, that it would become so uh, fundamental in our lives, Lord, that we would reflect upon it throughout the year with joy in our hearts. Lord, with glad tidings upon our lips as we go out and we share that good news with others, that your Son has come into this world. And because of that, there is joy to the entire world. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've entitled the message, Joy to the World. Uh, today, um, I wanted to let you guys know about Friday, my brother and I and our, our boys, we went out to go sledding. And we went up into the mountains above Woodland Park there, and I was so excited to go out and take the boys sledding. And, you know, I hadn't had a really good sledding experience since I was a little kid. Seems like every time in the last 20 or 30 years we've tried to go sledding, it, we just couldn't find a good place. There wasn't enough snow or somebody got hurt or, or it just was a bummer. And so I was just really looking forward. Now that I'm back in Colorado, we haven't been yet, except to that little place over there where you go down the hill and crash into the fence. I don't think that's a very good sledding area. I don't know why they let you sled there. But anyway, uh, so we went up into the mountains and, uh, we got there and, and found this awesome sledding hill. It was designed for sledding. And uh, and I thought, man, this is going to be great. And we were so excited, so full of joy, so full of happiness. Couldn't wait. 
I saw my my youngest son get on the sled first, and he went down that hill first, and he just took off. And I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome. And he had a great time, so I grabbed my sled, and I jumped on there, and I went screaming down that hill. And I laughed harder than I've laughed in I don't know how long. Uh, it was just great. But my happiness very quickly turned to sorrow. As I got up from the sled and looked down and saw my brother's cell phone that I had in my pocket, it had fallen out. But my cell phone was in that pocket as well. And I yelled up the hill, hey, did you find my cell phone? And they said, yeah, we got it. And by the time I got up to the top of that hill, I realized that something else had fallen out of that pocket. Gary's keys to the car (laughs) that we drove up to the top of that mountain with. (laughs) I had borrowed the keys to go get the cell phones, but I didn't put them in my pocket. I put them in my coat pocket, and now they're lost. And so we thought, okay, no problem. You know, let's look back through here. Surely we can find these keys. No problem. There's only about two and a half inches of snow out there, and and no problem. We can find these keys. For the next three and a half hours, we searched. We, my brother and I, the kids were all sledding, having a great time. We searched for keys. For three and a half hours. And all of the joy, all of the happiness that that started out that day was gone. I tried to maintain a a good face and and I wanted to have fun. I tried to sled a few more times, figuring I'd come back up the hill searching for the keys. But I, I just couldn't have any fun. I was in anguish. I was stressed out. You know, all the thoughts of going through your head. What are we going to do? It's getting late, you know. The sun's starting to go down. And uh, how are we going to get out of here? And uh, now we got to call the wives and have them drive all the way up here. And we're going to ruin their plans. They were out shopping and doing their thing. And and uh, we searched for about two hours. And then we thought, well, we, we need to call or it's going to be too late. And so we call and I got a hold of Janet. And she was not too happy with me. <laughs> she was not too happy with me. I ruined her day. I ruined her day. I ruined my wife's day because now they got to turn around and drive up that mountain and come and find us and didn't know if they'd find us or not because of where we were and we were a little worried about that and and the car door is locked and this place was going to close. It was near there and and just all these things going through my head. I began to worry and I began to think, man, this is a such a bummer. I was frustrated. And... Uh, the guy that operated this little store up there, he had some rakes. And we said, well, let's give us these rakes and let's see if we can rake through the snow. We figured out how to unlock the door. We we uh, got a hanger in there and unlocked the door so we'd at least have a place to get out of the cold waiting for the ladies to come and get us. I raked down that mountainside about three quarters of the way down. It's, a, it's about a 200-yard, you know, two football fields long down this sledding run. And uh, I raked about, I don't know, a little over halfway down that thing, and I finally found those keys under the snow. (laughs) And I said, Eureka! (laughs) I found it! (laughs) You know? And oh, the joy (laughs) that flooded my soul (laughs) at that moment. We were saved, you know, in a sense. I mean, we were really in a, a pickle. Uh, of course, you know, we would have gotten saved one way or the other, but man, the joy that flooded my heart when I found those keys, I was so happy. And all that anguish and all that stress and all that stuff that I'd been going through for the last three hours was gone because we knew that we were safe. We knew that all of that stuff was over and done with. And so we started coming back down that hill. And, you know, I was thinking about that in, in the light of the message here today. How do we get joy in this world that is so filled with fear, so filled with stress, so filled with anguish, so filled with just horrible things happening? Uh, as Chad spoke about, you know, the shootings and, and the fiscal cliff and, and all that stuff. By the way, I don't ever want to hear that term again, fiscal cliff. They need to change it. I've heard it so many times, but... How do we have joy in the midst of all of this? As these shepherds here on the side of this mountain were in fear, as they saw something they didn't understand, they saw something that they were afraid of, the angel began to say, don't be afraid. I have good news for you. I have good news of great joy 
There's a Savior born to you this day in the city of David. He's going to save all of mankind. And you know, when we as Christians began to grasp that concept, that because we have salvation, because we are safe in Him, because He has come, because Jesus came to this earth and and came God in the flesh and died upon that cross for our sins and rose again by the power of God, all the rest of it really doesn't matter, does it? Because of that, we have a hope. Because of that, we have joy in the midst of a situation where we really shouldn't have any joy. Now, had I known yesterday and I was trying real hard to pray and just have faith and God, I know you're going to find these keys for me, but uh, I was really faltering in that. But I got to a point, I got so frustrated and I just said, oh Lord, help us find these keys. Lord, open my eyes, give me wisdom here. And, and, and right at that moment, I felt like I should go to the other side of that trail. And I raked down that trail about 15 more feet and there were those keys. But in the midst of that, I didn't know if we'd find those keys. And I was so upset because here I'd lost my brother's keys. You know, he drove his expedition up there and lost his keys. I know he was bummed out and, and just the whole thing. Had I known that those keys will show up before we go home that day, what joy I would have had in my heart. Hey, it's all right. We'll find the keys before it's time to go. Let's just go out and sled some more. There were two other sledding runs on the other side of that hill that we were on, but I couldn't go over there. The kids eventually went over there and had a great time. It was a better sledding run than the one we were on, but I never got to sled on it because I was so fixated upon finding those keys. I was so fixated upon that stressful situation I was in, I didn't get to experience that joy. And so as we look at this today, you know, just a couple of things. You remember that old song that we sang here this morning, Joy to the World. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Let your heart prepare and and open up and receive this joy that he wants to bring into our lives. Yes, Jesus was rejected. Yes, he was killed and and he raised from the dead and he went back to be with the Father. But he's coming again someday. Joy to the world. The Lord is coming again. Prepare your heart some room for that joy. Because certainly, I, I don't know that I've ever seen it any more, you know, our world in, in, in my lifetime. I can't remember a time where there was more uncertainty. I can't remember a time in my life that was, there was more angst and, and, and just awful things going on in our world and, and just the financial situation. And I'm sure some of you that were here, you know, Vietnam and Korean War, dare I say World War II, um, <laughs> you know, those times, I, I know there were times that, that it's been more uncertain, but uh, it, it just seems like our world is, is just going in the wrong direction. And certainly it is. Prepare some room in your heart for the joy that God wants to give you this coming year. Amen? In Isaiah, the book of Isaiah is an amazing book because the first 40 chapters really deal with judgment. Because the children of Israel have been disobedient, God is talking to them about a judgment that is coming upon their nation. But the last part of that book, the rest of the book, deals with after that judgment has taken place, the peace that will come as God brings his Savior, his Messiah, and that kingdom is set up for all of eternity. The joy, the peace, the comfort that will come as God comforts his people. And so Isaiah speaks for the Lord here, and he says, Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. A little bit later, Isaiah 66, 10. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her. All you who love her, rejoice for joy with her. All you who mourn for her, that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom. 
that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. There will be peace in the Middle East someday. There will be peace on this earth someday. But it will only happen when the Prince of Peace comes again. He came the first time to bring that peace that is being discussed right here, but he was rejected as we've been studying on Sunday mornings in the book of Mark. The nation rejected him. They said, we don't want your peace. We don't want you to reign over us. We don't want what you have to say. We're rejecting you. There's a a bishop of Carthage who was martyred in 258, Cyprian, his name. And before he died, he wrote a letter to a friend of his to witness to him, in a sense. And he wrote in that letter, it is a bad world. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which, a thou- which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are Christians, and I am one of them. Now, can we say that today? This was in the midst of the persecution where people were going to the stake and being burned alive. Their heads were being chopped off. They were being placed on uh, a stick and, and dipped in wax and, and then burned to light the courtyards of the, the Caesars. They were being blamed for the burning of Rome and they were being persecuted as a result of that. The faith of Christianity was, they were trying to stamp it out by killing all the Christians. And in the midst of that kind of a persecution, this guy, this bishop, this pastor of Carthage, says, hey, I have found that there's a, there's a faith that can bring you peace even in the midst of all of that persecution. And that only comes when we have that hope of Jesus Christ and his salvation reigning in our hearts and in our minds as we keep that in the forefront of our minds. So joy to the world. Looking at the verses again, I'm, I'm not going to go verse by verse necessarily like I normally do. I just want to take a look at this passage a little bit here today and, and just bring out a few things. Again, in verse 8 there, it says that there were shepherds in that country living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. You know, if you go up to verse 7, it says that she brought forth, Mary did, her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, cloths and lie, uh, laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. These are the most humble of origins, aren't they? Uh, certainly God could have chosen to uh, go to the, the palaces of Babylon or, or the palaces of Rome and choose to bring forth his son in one of those uh, you know, eloquent settings. Uh, through a, a royal line that is still established in, in one of these great nations that were upon the earth at that time. He could have done that, but he chose to bring forth Jesus in, in a manger, a, a feeding trough. That's what a manger is. You know, it's not a, it's not a cozy little bed like the one we saw in the, the picture up there. It's a feeding trough. It's where you take the hay and put it in the trough and say, okay, horsey, come over here and eat your food. That's what Jesus was born into, that kind of a situation. Maybe it was wood, maybe it was a, a rock or a hole in the ground or something, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a glorious place to be born. The angels come to the meek of the earth. The shepherds were despised. These guys are living out in the fields. They're sleeping on the ground with sheep. They were despised by the, the high priests of Jerusalem. And of course, as we've been looking at the book of Mark and, and just how, uh, you know, how that, that priesthood was operating at that time, they were very, very wealthy. Uh, they were very, very dishonest. And, uh, you know, they despised those shepherds. They looked down upon them. But God says, no, I'm going to begin by revealing myself 
to the, the most meek and the most humble of the entire earth. And that's the way Jesus came into this world. Well, the message, I think, is the important thing. What did the angel say here? The angel of the Lord, verse 9, stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. To all people. God's plan was always to spread the gospel to the entire world, to use the nation of Israel uh, as a launching point, to bring his good news, to bring his glad tidings or good tidings of great joy to the, to the entire world because, you know, we're all the same all around the world. We all have the same kind of motivations. We all have the same kind of desires. And, and if you... Read back through history, man has always been the same. There's no difference. There's nothing new under the sun, Solomon said. We're all the same. We're all a bunch of sinners that need to be saved by grace. And so the Lord says, I'm going to bring this message to the whole earth, to all people. Joy to the world, not just to some. To all who will accept it. To all who will accept that that good news and those glad tidings. Look at the message there. No fear. Don't fear. I have good news for you. And that is cause for great joy. Again, as as we look at the world that we're living in, there's not a whole lot of good news out there. As you listen to the radio on the way to work, as you watch the news when you come home from work or wherever you're at, there's not a whole lot of good news to be had. It just seems that things are getting worse and worse and worse. And I believe that they will continue. You know, no matter what laws are passed to keep people from shooting each other, you know, man has always found a way to kill his fellow man. And the Bible says that the the love of many will grow cold towards the end. Before the Lord returns, men's hearts will be cold towards each other. And just as in the days of Noah, Jesus said, that's when I'm going to come back. And it's going to be just like the days of Noah. And we find in the Bible that the world was destroyed in the days of Noah because violence had filled the earth. And we certainly see that today, that violence is becoming more and more in in our faces and, and just permeating our entire society, no, what, no matter what town you live in, whether it's the dirty streets of Chicago or, or, or some little hamlet in Connecticut somewhere. Violence has filled the hearts of men and filled the minds of men and women. And it's being played out in that way. But in the midst of that, God says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I've got good news for you. Great joy can be had. And we find that that's very difficult. And I just ask you the question here, what are you afraid of in the coming year? As that little calendar ticks from 2012 to 2013, isn't that amazing? 2013, can you believe that? Time just keeps rolling on, doesn't it? Just keeps rolling on. But... With the coming year, there's always the thought, what's, what's coming in that new year? What dangers will I face? What, what's going to happen to me in the, ne- in the next year? What's going to happen with this, this fiscal problem that's going on? How, many, how much are my taxes going to go up? Will I be able to feed my children? Will I be able to pay my bills? Will I be able to do the things I want to do in life or Or will this be the year that bankruptcy finally catches up with me? Will this be the year that I lose my job? You know, I've been hanging on for this recession and they're talking about the recession getting worse and am I going to lose my job? Am I going to be like one of those folks that are out there? Or maybe you're already unemployed. Maybe you're in that place of, man, I I haven't had a job in two or three years. I'm still waiting because this economy is so bad. How am I going to continue on? Well, the Bible very clearly tells us that we can have a joy 
and we can have a peace even in the midst of all those kind of things surrounding us in our lives. I love what uh, Charles Wesley said. I rest beneath the Almighty's shade. My griefs expire, my troubles cease. Thou, Lord, on whom my soul is stayed, will keep me still in perfect peace. Perfect peace. As I trust in him, as I put my faith in him, as I put my hope in him, he says, I'll bring you peace that passes all understanding. Don't be anxious, just trust in me. Just look to me. Be thankful for the things that you have and be in that place of just trusting in me and you'll have that peace, that perfect peace that passes all understanding. Jesus talked about that. As he was leaving his disciples, he said these words, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm not just going to take off and leave and and not give you any assistance. There's going to be a comforter that will come to give you that peace within your heart. And you know, as Christians, as as we anguish over the things that we see in this world, as we just strive over them and stress out about those things, We're not trusting in Him. We're not trusting in in that promise that He has given us. That His Holy Spirit will reside in our hearts and bring us that peace that that Jesus promised He'd leave with us. It's not like the world gives. The world doesn't have any peace to offer, does it? We go out there and we, we try to get some peace from the world and they say, well, here, drink this, that'll give you peace. Smoke this, that'll give you peace. Drop one of these, that'll give you peace. Well, I've been there and I'll tell you that it doesn't give you any peace. None of it. The world can't bring peace. And it cannot give you peace. But the peace that Jesus brought into this world, He needed to come into this world so that his, and then go away so that His Holy Spirit could come and give us that peace that we need so desperately. Someone once said that safety consists not in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. And I think that's so true. You think about it, well, take away the pain, take away the trouble, take away all that stuff and I'll have peace. No, you'll have peace if you trust in God and reside in his presence, abide in his presence. The peace that Jesus gives is not the absence of trouble, but is rather the confidence that he is there with you Always. And that's the idea of the video I showed this morning. Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. God living in my heart, bringing me that peace. Bringing me, bringing me that, to that place of saying, you know, it's all right. God's with me. And whatever happens to me in this situation, I know that God has allowed it to happen. And, and I'm, so I'm just going to trust in Him. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to be anxious about it. I'm just going to let it go because... This is what God has said in his word. Am I going to trust the circumstances that I see around me? Am I going to look to the, the, the world around me and say, well, this is what I see with my physical eyes, and so I, I can't trust what God's word says. I can't trust his promises. I'll have to trust what I see out there. And sure enough, you will be like a wave of the sea, crashing back and forth. Like the, the grass out in the field being blown back and forth never having any peace whatsoever. Again, Jesus in John sixteen thirty three says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In Jesus, because he came, because God humbled himself and came down to this earth, in him we can have peace in the midst of this storm that we're in. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that's that idea that we've talked about so many times that you are more than a conqueror if you know the outcome of the battle. If I know what's going to happen, I can have peace about it and I can have joy about it in the midst of that storm. Jesus says, I've overcome the world. I've beaten it. I've established the victory. I've conquered death. 
I've conquered this world. I've overcome it. And so don't have fear. In the world, you're going to go through bad times. You're going to go through tribulations, but be of good cheer. Be joyful about those things because he's already overcome it. We just have to work that out in our own lives. Sometimes it's very painful to do that, though. However, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's the rub. You know, there's a a guy who once sat down, he was a painter, and he, he sat down to paint a picture of what perfect peace looked like. And he tried several different ideas, and and uh, just nothing seemed to fit. And, and so he thought, well, this is a great idea. And And so he established a contest, and he said, look... All around the world, I want painters everywhere to paint a picture of what perfect peace looks like. And then we'll judge at the end of that contest and the winner will get whatever. But that was the contest. Draw what perfect peace looks like. Paint a picture of perfect peace. And so from all around the world, these beautiful paintings began to flow in. of These beautiful scenes in the mountains and meadows and sheep and, and all of these kind of sunset pictures at, out on the ocean and calm seas and all those kind of pictures started to flow in. But those pictures didn't win the prize. The picture that won the prize was one of a storm, black skies, a raging flood coming through a valley as a result of that storm. It's not this picture, by the way. And in the corner of that picture... There was a little bird's nest and a bird in perfect peace over her eggs or over her chicks, guarding and protecting them. That's the one that won the picture because you have the contrast, a raging storm, a raging sea, a flood all around you, but in the midst of that, a little mama bird protecting her chicks in perfect peace. It's a great example of what the Lord is saying here. Again, we go back to Isaiah 26.3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for in Yah or Yahweh, short for Yahweh there, the Lord is everlasting strength. I love that verse. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. The one who trusts in the Lord because of his everlasting strength, the strength that spoke the worlds into existence, the strength that spoke the universe into existence, the everlasting strength that raised people from the dead, that raised Jesus from the dead, who is still alive at our Father's side. That peace that same peace, that same power, that same strength is what is able to give us perfect peace in the midst of any storm. Have we reached out and grabbed that though? And it's very hard not to look at the the waves and the wind. That's what Peter did. Step out on the water. He was doing pretty good until he started looking at those waves and the wind and everything and he began to sink sink, didn't he? Because he took his eyes off of Jesus. He began to look at the circumstances rather than look at Jesus. And that's when he failed. Well, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And we can't have a great Christmas message without going back to Isaiah and looking at that very well-known prophecy about the Messiah coming. Isaiah 9.6 Isaiah 9, six. what do we find there? It says, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. 
even forever. What is Jesus? What is that son that we are celebrating today? That child who was born? What is he really? Is he, is he a good moral teacher? Well, the Bible is very clear here. A prophecy given 700 years in advance of Jesus being born says that he is a wonderful counselor or the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. And because he is the Prince of Peace and because he has this power given to him by his Father, he can bring that perfect peace into our lives. He has brought that perfect peace into this world through his Holy Spirit working now while he is not upon the earth. But ultimately, that perfect peace will be established when he returns to to set up his thousand year reign here upon this earth. A reign that will never end. He'll be here a thousand years reigning from Jerusalem, but then ultimately he'll reign over a new heavens and a new earth. That's the promise that we're given in his word. Well, turning back over to Luke A couple more verses and then we'll wrap up. In Luke chapter 2, again, looking at uh, verse 10, then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I've already read that. Uh, Verse 11 says, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Swaddling clothes, that, that whole phrase there, wrapped in swaddling clothes, is all one word in the Greek. And it's the idea of strips that are just wrapped around a child, wrapped around that whole baby. Strips of cloth that are wrapped around. And that's how they did it back in those days. It's all one word there. But the main thing that we have to focus on here is there's a child born to you in the city of David. He's coming from the line of David. He is the king of kings. He is the Messiah that has been prophesied. The the anointed one is what Christ means in the Greek. He's the one that we've been waiting for. And he is our Savior. As Chad said this morning, there are many things that we need in this life. But the one thing that we desperately need is a Savior. The one thing that we absolutely have to have especially if we're going to have any kind of peace on this earth in our own hearts, is a Savior to save us from our sins. I was thinking about, you know, when we were up on that mountain on Friday and I, I made a huge mistake. I, I, it was so stupid of me to put those keys and, and those phones in my coat pocket because it wasn't a very good pocket. It didn't have a zipper. But I hadn't planned on going down the hill but I got so excited about getting on that sled and going down the hill that it overtook my thoughts. And I made that decision to jump on there and go down that hill. And because of that silly, stupid decision that I made, it caused the anguish of the rest of that day for me, for my brother, for our wives. But in a larger scale, you know, that's what sin is all about. Decisions that we make, selfish decisions, stupid decisions that we make in this life, mistakes that we make in this life, cause harm to ourselves, cause anguish to ourselves and to others, and often causes, you know, destroys people's lives, the decisions that we make. We destroy our own life, and in the process we destroy the lives of the people we love and the people that we don't even know. And that's what sin does. We are unable to conquer that. We're unable, because we are who we are and we're made in the way that we're made, we are fallible creatures, doomed to make those kind of mistakes, doomed to fail and to fall short of the glory of God. And we desperately, desperately need a Savior every Last one of us. When we look at, you know, poor people or people hooked on drugs and say, well, those people definitely need a Savior. 
No, it's everybody. The banker, the, the scientist, everybody. We all need a Savior. It's not just how our lifestyle is being run. It's because deep within our hearts, each one of us are desperately wicked. Maybe it doesn't come out in the ways that, that it comes out in the life of an addict or, or somebody that's living out on the streets or, or that, that kind of thing, but every one of us have a sin issue and every one of us need to be saved. And that is why it's such good news that Jesus came. He was born our Savior to save us from our sins, to save us from damnation because we have fallen short of the glory of God, because we have been disobedient to Him, because we have taken His word and His standards and and His uh, statutes and said, I don't want any of that. I want to live my life to please myself. I want to live my life in any way that I see fit. And we need a Savior to bring us to that place of realizing that we're broken and in need of a Savior. And so the angels there give them a sign and say, you'll know that this is the child because he'll be wrapped up and he'll be in a manger. Most of the other babies are in a nice warm house, but this one you're going to find out in the feeding trough, out in the, in the cave or out in the, uh, the barn there. Last verse I want to look up for us here. Hope brings joy and peace. If we have a hope, if we have a hope that we will be saved, that is what brings that eternal hope and joy and peace within our lives. If you turn there to uh, Titus just for a minute. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus. Don't miss it. It's pretty small. One page. (laughs) But in that verse there, in Titus 2, verse 11, it says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And so he says, speak these things, exhort and rebuke and with all authority, let no one despise you. Jesus brings that hope into our lives. Now, what's the response? How should we respond to that? Well, I think we really need to follow the lead of the angels here. The angels know how to respond. Anytime as you're reading through the Bible and they're talking about the angels, watch what the angels do. Not the angels that fell and followed after Satan. The good angels, watch what they do. Because they always have the right response. When somebody kneels down to worship one of the angels, hey, hey, get up, don't do that. Oh, we know what happens when people start worshiping angels. No, don't do that. And here we find the same thing. The angels know how to respond to this situation. Going back over to Mark, or to uh, Luke, one more time. He says there in verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That's our response. Because God has done these things, because he has sent his son, because he has brought into this world the opportunity for us to be saved, because he has brought that hope and that that peace into our lives to bring us that joy, what's our response? Oh, praise God. Praise God. Glory to God in the highest. He's worthy to be praised, isn't he? How often do we lose that that consciousness of what he has done on my behalf? I know I'm terrible at at forgetting the magnitude of what he has done for us. How often do we just begin to just spontaneously, oh God, you're great, you're awesome. Now I did it after I found the keys. You know, 
That was my response. Oh, praise the Lord. Now, I said Eureka first. But then I began to just praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Praise you for giving me the insight to find these keys. Give him glory. Give him honor. Give him praise. He is certainly worthy of those things because of what he has given us. He's brought joy. He's brought peace into our lives. Psalm 96, 7 says, Give to the Lord, O families of peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then let the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. Now, you think about that. The earth being glad. The fields being joyful. God's creation knows how to respond to Him. And they do the things. They're obedient to do the things that He has created them to do. And in that, they're giving Him praise and they're giving Him honor and glory because they're doing what they were designed to do. You and I were designed to give glory to God. You and I were created to praise His name and to give glory to Him. Not only at Christmas time, not only at Easter time, but every day of our lives, every morning. I'm so convicted about that. You know, I, I try to just wake up and the first thought is before my feet even hit the ground to acknowledge Him. But some days I get busy. Some days I get stressed out. Some days I'm thinking about, oh man, what am I going to do today? And oh, i got to get this done. And, and the stress of the world begins to crowd out the primary thing that each one of us have to be concerned with. That I am created, I'm on this earth to give Him glory, to give Him honor, to give Him praise with everything that I do in my life. For he is coming, he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Now that might scare you. That might put, wait, I'm supposed to have joy here. He's coming to judge? Well, he is coming to judge. But if your heart is in the right place, that's a, that's a call for rejoicing. That's a call for us to rejoice. Because he is coming back to set things right. He's coming back to fix what is broken. He's coming back in power and glory to establish righteousness upon this earth. Because certainly it is not right now. But it's a call for us to rejoice, have joy, because he is going to come back and establish that righteousness. Amen? Well, all that is because he came. All that is because a little baby was born and was wrapped in those swaddling clothes and laid in a manger 2,000 years ago. But he's not in that manger now. That's the real danger about Christmas, you know, is, is people just see Jesus as this little fragile baby in a manger. He, he is not that anymore. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And he is worthy of honor and praise and glory. He's worthy of everything that we can give him in our own lives. And he's worthy of us living our lives to honor and praise him and to turn people to him. To take the good news that we have found and give it to others. Amen? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you for your truth, Lord. Most of all, we thank you for your son coming to this earth, humble and meek, little baby in that manger so long ago. Lord, we thank you for what this means to us. Lord, we thank you for the peace that we can have in our hearts in the midst of the worst storm, in the midst of the worst battle. Lord, we know that your word says that we can have peace. Lord, help us to experience that. Help us to grab onto that in this coming year. 
Lord, as we look out and we see a, a very uncertain world, a very uncertain time that we are living in, a lot of fear, a lot of turmoil in our world. Lord, we ask that your will would be accomplished in our nation, in this world, as it is in heaven, Father, that it would be accomplished here on this earth, whatever that is, whether it be judgment, whether it be reconciliation, Father, whether it would be repentance, Lord, whatever it is, we ask that that would be accomplished here in this coming year. Because, Lord, we want what you want. Lord, we know when we put our hearts in that place that we can have perfect peace because you have overcome the world. You have overcome death. You have overcome the devil. And Father, as we trust in you now and, and put our lives in your hands in the coming year, Father, we pray for that joy. We pray for that peace in each of our hearts as we go forward to spread that good news that you have given us. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.